I want to give you an insider's perspective on the automotive industry by commenting on an article recently published in Wired called Women Buy More Cars, So Why Are They Still So Macho? There's a lot to unpack here in this article. So many interesting points about how the industry is evolving and why we need more people who are different in the space. The key takeaway is that this industry is a lot more complex and nuanced. Even if you don't think that cars are God's gift to mankind, this is an interesting space for you to have a career because so much is changing. There are so many impacts that this has on society and so much opportunity to make a difference in the world. And how do I know this? Well, I've been working in automotive for three and a half years now. It's where I started my formal career. The last two and a half years, I've been working in an automotive design department. My role as a design strategist looks at the world. It looks at the industry, competitors, all sorts of things. It understands people in the industry to best position the design department to meet the company goals and ambitions. My specific focus is around people and how do we get people to do their best work, more effective, to implement the strategies that the team I work in creates. And with my background in organizational psychology and my position as a design strategist, I think I have the perfect blend to give commentary on this article, which is about industry, it is about product, and it is about people. Before I dive into giving my personal perspective that is reflective of me, um, I also want to highlight that it is so important someone has written this article. There is almost no commentary on the fact that there are few women in automotive and fewer women in automotive design. The fact that someone has spoken about this topic in a really public way means something is shifting right now. Something about content creation is changing and that is really important to recognize. It means the space is opening up for more people who are different, who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, who have different gender, religion, race. There is potential here and I want to highlight that potential for you but also give you a nuanced, detailed view about the space, where it's come from some of the toxicity that exists within it, some of the things that people who are different have to grapple with if they want to lead a thriving career in the space. But it is so important because the automotive industry has such an impact on our society, how people live, who has accessibility to different spaces. Everything is timestamped. So if you want to skip to where all of those opportunities lies, you do that. But I hope you stick around so you get a realistic view. I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I'm going to say it how it is, which is not what you get from many other commentators in the space. Most people are really fearful for their career. They don't want anything to impact the thing that they love. And in automotive design, that is the ability to design this incredible product, which is hyper complex. It's also why you don't see a lot of commentary from women on the harsher things about this industry. No one wants to be labeled the woman who complains or the feminist. And even in this article, you'll see there are not many women who are commenting at all. Most of the quotes are coming from men. So if we hop into the Miro, immediately you can see there's something about the Cybertruck. There's some pink background, so we're thinking, hmm, Cybertruck, woman, what's going on? The article is contextualizing more masculinity with the Cybertruck, which is clearly a more angular, more masculine, more threatening car, to be blunt. It's saying, how does this product come into existence? when it's more women who are making buying decisions about cars, and this is clearly extremely masculine. Overarching in the article, the message is, maybe more women should have an influence on how we produce cars, then we might get products that serve people in a different way. That's my interpretation, with a lot of details in between. I tend to agree, there should be more people who are different and more people who are representative of the buyers in this space. It's unpacking the Cybertruck, the masculinity, angularity. A lot of automotive designers have reacted to this in quite a negative way, kind of like, what is going on here? And this article says that too. The Cybertruck is now a bookend, or what we say, one extreme, you know, like on a bookshelf. There's a bookend here and a bookend here and so many books in between in terms of a spectrum. And the other extreme, which the article basically ignores, is a lot of what's happening in Asia right now. This article is extremely Western focused. It hasn't really commented on China, Japan, they're having an EV kind of boom. And there are many new automotive manufacturers there showing up, you know, little sprouts flowering everywhere. And it's a very different aesthetic. Yes, there are different values in that society. So different things are kind of being put into the products. For example, in Japan, there are things called K cars, which are these tiny, cute little cars. And those are because the needs of that society, that city are different from other parts of the world. And that's another extreme bookend of the spectrum that we see that isn't called out here. Cars and what is produced is heavily intertwined with society. And so what Tesla and Elon is basically doing is understanding society at large and providing a product 
for the direction that society is going in. So outside of that feminine, masculine uh, microcosm, looking to the broadness of society, he's just serving a need. And that is something else I want to point out here is when people buy a car, they're expressing an emotion or an aspiration. So women, even though there might be more feminine or more gender neutral cars on the market that they could buy into, they're still buying more masculine cars. Why is that? Well, cars represent something about people. It's part of their identity. And in the same way, buying a Tesla in the beginning said something about someone's commitment to a sustainability or even that they were just someone who tries something radically different, who is against the norms. Women are buying into masculinity because society is valuing something about that trait, that quality. We can't just give women what we perceive as being a feminine car or something that they might want and expect women to buy because that's not going to signal what they need in that society. And these are the sorts of hidden needs that we need to unpack as designers to really s serve people and create products that are sticky. So the next section of the article, Rethink the Automobile, this is calling out that as we shift from internal combustion cars to electric cars, there are many elements of the car that can change. I think of the car as a puzzle. So when you remove one piece, like the combustion engine, and introduce another piece, like the battery pack, these are two different sizes. They need to fit somewhere else within the car. And this means that we can rearrange the puzzle. And as we rearrange the puzzle, that fluidity in the product means we can also introduce other things that maybe we hadn't thought of before or weren't possible before in the previous configuration. So as this shift takes place, cars have different functional needs, but we can also meet people's needs. We can serve the user, the customer, in a different way. What is an example of this? Well, as we take out the engine from the front, we can shorten the bonnet and we can extend the wheelbase, which also means we have more space within the car. So we can provide the second row, which is previously deprioritized, maybe a better experience as an example. The other thing we can do is just keep that wheelbase the same size, you know, and put less content into the car, which means we're using less resources from the planet, less metal, less other components. And so cars become smaller, which is maybe not what we're seeing in the US right now. Uh, so there's a lot that can change here, but we need people who are different, who can think differently to bring these new perspectives, what people actually want, not just what the people who are currently in the organization might want. Now I'm getting ahead of myself, a little foreshadowing for the next section. Where are the female heads of design? So most of the major original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, are men. It's no surprise cars have long been associated with testosterone-fueled stereotype. Even crash test dummies have historically been made with male in mind. I've made a whole video on that exact topic and how cars are more dangerous for women because of that. This is where I highlight designers and deciders choose what to prioritize within the car. Of course, if you are a man and you value certain things for yourself, you are going to have a bias, a leniency towards that content. And you are going to choose when you're balancing all of the different features of the car, the different costs that go into the car, what resonates with you, whether it's conscious or unconscious. I frequently refer to designers and deciders because sure, the design department can be incredibly diverse. It can have gender balance. It can make a product that is going to fit the customer's needs entirely. But then you come into the feasibility section. Can engineering actually make this thing happen? And financially, viably, can this work? Are we going to make money from this thing? And that's where the deciders come in. So if the deciders in the business are also still all men, then design is not going to get what it wants. And we can't blame just design on the fact that cars are so masculine, even though the ratio of designers is one woman to 25 men historically. Thank you, Concept House, for that data. This goes into pointing out some companies that have had heads of female designers. Kind of interesting. There aren't many. I think there's max three women who have ever led a design department overall. Um, if I can solve all the problems inherent in operating a vehicle for a woman, that'll make it much easier for a man to use. If we design for the most vulnerable person in a space, whatever word you want to use there, it generally tends to make better outcomes for everybody else. Now I really want to get into the nuances of why is this an unattractive career? Because I'm going to be unfiltered, I'm going to be direct. It's great that this topic is being spoken about, like I said before, but my first instinct is, we're talking about an unattractive career for women in automotive design, and the very first quote that this article has is from a man. Chris Bangle, highly respected designer, and clearly from how he's elevated women within different companies and different spaces, he's someone that women want to work for. It's a really good quote to have, but 
If you want to know about why a career is unattractive for someone, ask that person. Get their nuanced perspective, which is what I'm about to give you. I've spoken about this in my other videos. If you want more details, check those out. But this article, when I say it's beige, has not at all recognized the sexism, the bias, and the systematic microaggressions that women experience every single day still today. The reason that not many women have spoken about this topic is because they do not have the psychological safety where they feel their career won't be impacted if they speak out. Let me put that another way. People are afraid that if they talk about what's actually happening in their jobs, that there will be ramifications on their career. Why do I feel like I'm safe enough to speak about this? A. I feel incredibly psychologically safe within my company and my team. Although I position automotive as being incredibly exciting, I have an anti-why. And I have a video on anti-whys. If everything in my life goes to shit, I have a plan. So I feel very secure in the fact that I can speak about these hard topics. And hopefully, by being a first mover in this space, other people will feel comfortable enough to speak about them as well. And third, it is literally my job to make people's lives at work better. So I can tie this directly to the work that I'm doing, even though this is a bit more activist and extreme, and I've had some white British males tell me I am too activist. And I will continue to speak about this because I come from South Africa and far too many people for far too long did not speak about the atrocities that were happening in the space. That is a different extreme, but it taught me that if I see something wrong, I need to be the one to speak about it. And what I'm saying here is that this industry has treated women in a really poor way probably many other demographics as well, and it's been to its own detriment. I truly believe that if we have more people who are different in this space, the industry would look radically different and society would benefit from it. And that is why I am such a strong advocate for this topic, and it's why I speak about it. Um, so, okay, whew, decompress a little bit from that uh, kind of serious. What is an environment that fosters a thriving career? That is the question that I ask myself. And the key thing from this section how Bangle took up a department that was 9% female to 29% in his tenure from 1992 to 2009, it says that there is a mechanism for improving an environment that then people want to work in. And part of that is probably eliminating sexism, bias, and microaggressions. I have another video on how we can go about doing that. Also understanding what legacy things from your design process represent and benefit male characteristics. One example in design is there is a competition system. People are competing against each other for their designs to be the ones that are chosen and then be the lead of that program. And what are the qualities that mean someone is leading? What type of design is valued? How does someone speak about their design, unpack their design, uh, have confidence or strength or are able to fight for their perspective? And those are, can all be viewed as quite male qualities that society naturally teaches men, but doesn't naturally teach women. So if women show up in a space with less of those qualities, um, they might be deemed lesser than. And then moving down a little bit, maybe just getting into car design as a career is unattractive if the subject at hand doesn't engage you. But I don't know if that's true to the point that it excludes anyone from the game. Lots of women are petrol heads, but if you go back to when the current crop of top managers was formed, what was the situation for becoming a car designer? Bangle here is hinting at the system of exclusion. It's saying that if you go back in time, that system did not benefit women. So this is where I think the article is a little bit mm, surface level. It could really unpack what I've just mentioned. And of course, if you're a top talent in a space and there is exclusion, your work isn't being seen and recognized, you constantly feel a dissonance and a stress between the qualities you're expected to show and the qualities that you are naturally inclined towards, then that space is not where you're going to thrive. And any sane person would leave. We don't look at someone in an abusive relationship and say, oh, you love that person. They're abusing you. You should stay with them. No, we tell them to get the fuck out. That's exactly what happens in the space. Women enter. They are so passionate about automotive design and automotive in general. And then they see that the space is not for them because they are incredibly talented and can exist in many other contexts. They leave. The other thing I haven't pointed out in the stickies here, but the people who had privilege back in the day that got their jobs are now the top managers of today. They are the deciders. We still have all of the hangovers from back in the day happening right now within the industry, which is one reason why a lot of companies are going through this sort of identity crisis where European autom automotive just doesn't know what it's doing in this new context, in this new age. 
And that's because those people are all the same. It's all part of a monoculture. And of course, that monoculture is not going to serve the very diverse, very globalized society that we have today. And then not seen as a priority, no. Women are still not being developed. The university ratio is not as bad as company ratios, one to 25. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's like eight to 25, something like that, but it's still not seen as a priority. And what I'm hinting at in all my other commentary is that this is the irony. The deciders and designers of today are too busy putting out fires in the shift from combustion to EV to really prioritize this as a topic. But if they had done this a while ago, then they would have people who are different in the space already who could support through this radical shift and take advantage of a lot of the uncertainty and disruption as a result of this shift. So it's ironic that the people who were excluded are now the ones who could actually make a real difference in this space. Then, I remember one of my managers made a point of saying to me, we didn't hire you because you're a female, we hired you because of your portfolio. No one wants to feel like a token in a room. I'm not saying hire women even though they're lesser than other colleagues. What I am pointing out is who gets the opportunity to develop a good portfolio? Who gets the opportunity for mentorship and the encouragement from society around them that this is a career for you? Because there are so few female leaders in this space, there are also a few female role models. And I could hedge some bets on the fact that those female leaders are so busy having to focus on their career and having to advocate for themselves, engage in qualities that might not be their natural tendencies, that they don't have time to develop the next wave of talent coming through. And because companies aren't incentivizing them to do that, they're not prioritizing them, they're not going to do it. This is not me critiquing them. This is me critiquing the system that creates the incentives for people in it. And then last, society dictates exposure. Exposure that I stumbled upon this field. Yes, it is society that says this career is for boys, this career is for girls. And we need to be creating more exposure for very young people that this is something for you. At the end, the article does hint at something that is key. If the products were more gender neutral or feminine, then maybe more young people would look at the industry and say, this is for me, I want to work there. And that is a key piece that we need to recognize and how it's a chicken and the egg scenario. We need to change one part of it so another part will change and it's a long-term thing. Now we're going to get into a little bit more of the industry shifts. Yes, EVs were originally for women and they never went anywhere because the designers and the deciders didn't think that women would have the buying power in order to make this something that was profitable. So it was killed. Just imagine if we had more women in that space who were able to design and decide about these products, our world could look radically different. Cars are such huge contributors to environmental impact. The world could be so different. And this is why we need people who are different in spaces to make these decisions. Uh, building design elements into cars that make sense for dogs and kids and groceries isn't sexist or buying into a stereotype. And this is saying that... Yes, women engage in these behaviors a lot more than men. Men still engage in these behaviors. If we design for the use cases that people have in this modern society, we'll get to a non-stereotypical product that fulfills the needs of people who previously have gone unrecognized. In that way, we create a product that is better for everybody. And that is what we need to be doing. If you go back to what I was saying around identity and expression and how we have social capital in the world, we need to really understand what drives people, what motivates them, why they do certain things. Then we can provide products that serve those needs and we can completely bypass this kind of stereotypical, this is a male behavior, this is a female behavior. No, these are just behaviors that people have and we're creating a product that's gonna make us money because we're serving your behaviors. And ultimately, that's what this industry is trying to do. They're trying to make a boatload of money for all of their investors. And this last point is around how female consumers are the ones deciding about cars. Women have never been served an experience that meets their hidden needs. Probably a lot of men haven't either because not all men are what we traditionally think of as males. And so you don't know what you don't know. You don't miss what you've never had. We don't even know what an excellent car could look like for people because it's always been one demographic heavily that is designing and deciding for everybody. When you have a monoculture, Volvo's all-female concept team, I love that there was an all-female concept team. That car never went into production and it was very much of a time. It had a lot of really great things that would have benefited everyone. And it had some stereotypical things that are kind of, okay, that's a female thing, but we don't necessarily need to give them anything specific. But this is kind of used as, hey, the industry has done this thing. 
No, we need a lot more than just one female concept team to show that we are really thinking about women and people who are different in this space. Um, and then at the end, I'm not sure if education systems have really caught up with the need of the industry. Well, that's because the need of the industry hasn't really been articulated. So universities are not incentivized to be more inclusive of women. Uh, a change in direction. This is the interesting part for everybody. There are huge industry shifts happening right now. Yes, we've spoken a lot about the shift from combustion to EV and how there are different needs and use cases as a result of that. There's also another really big one, which is the shift from analog and mechanical to digitization and software. A lot of people who live and work in developing countries will not realize that so many cars are now computers. I know I didn't realize this until I came to work at the current company I work at. You can look me up on LinkedIn. My car at home had an aux cable and that's how I played music. And that was my car for the last 15 years. To do a bit of context sitting here, the automotive industry for all of its hardware products has traditionally outsourced these to suppliers. And the car companies that you know of are actually just putting together all of these pieces. Some components it does make, but most of it is just being you know, put together and third party suppliers are the ones that have engineered it. This is where a lot of the cost comes onto the car. It's where Tesla really disrupt the industry. It, Elon said, this is all too expensive. I can't create the cars that I want. I'm just going to do it myself. And he did that both for hardware and he did that for software. So he was able to bring the price of EVs way down from where the industry thought it would be. And what the industry thought of were no's. No, we can't ever do mega casting. We can't ever do the door handles like that. It wasn't the industry saying that. It was the suppliers that were saying, we can't do this. Because Tesla went and did it, they were able to completely destroy, invalidate what the suppliers were saying, and that gave the OEMs leverage. They could then go to their suppliers and say, hey, Tesla's doing this, why can't you do this? To circle back is for software and digitalization. When the shift came to be more digital, to have screens that were um, more interactive, OEMs did the same thing they always did. They went to third-party suppliers, both for the hardware and for the software. What they found, though, is they could not compete with companies like Tesla, who were doing over-the-air updates and constantly updating their systems, because Tesla had full control over their software suite and also knew exactly what the hardware components were and what sort of software could actually work on those hardware components, whereas OEMs had neither. They had control over none of it. They couldn't go in and update their own software. They always had to be making requests from supplier, which added cost. It completely destroyed speed, so it wasn't even possible. And the shift that's happening now is that all of the OEMs are in-housing their software development, so they have more control over it. This is a slow process, and the organizations, to be completely blunt, have no idea of what the competency is needed in this space and the way of working, because the way of working for hardware is so different for software. You can't do the same thing. Because cars are so intertwined, hardware speaks so closely to software, things have to be developed together. So if you can think on these different levels, the industry really needs you. This is why it's such an exciting space for people who are quite multifaceted and can think in complexity. So moving from software, the other big shift is online sales. We all know that our purchasing behavior is shifting online. And when we want to go into an automotive dealership where we're going to have to negotiate and haggle, that's just not the way that the next generation of people are showing up in the world. Companies have recognized this and shifting to an online sales model. It's not that easy, though. Tesla could start from scratch, and they did, and prove that it was possible. But traditional OEMs have dealer networks, and they've relied on dealer networks to make money for however long that they've been in existence. So to completely eradicate dealer networks doesn't make a lot of sense either. They have to shift these dealer networks to be something other than what they are today. That comes with so much change required. It also comes with the software inf and infrastructure to make that sort of shift. So online sales is another huge thing that commercial operations in these businesses are having to engage in. And then sustainability. We all know that these cars that we drive are not good for the environment. Yes, shifting to EV will make some kind of change. We're not going to have a lot of the fumes going out into the world. But for an electric car and a combustion car to reach parity in terms of the environmental impact, the EVs are going to have to use green energy. So governments also need to show up in the space to make the shift to EV really worthwhile for the environment. And this is a basic explanation, but so many primary resources are coming from the planet to go into the batteries and other new components in EVs, especially the electrical system within EV cars, that it's not that much better for the environment 
to a certain point. We need a couple of other inputs in the system for make it for it to be truly valuable. And then the whole suite of skill, knowledge, competency that manufacturers need in this space to truly tell authentic sustainability stories, they don't have them yet. So there's so much opportunity for people to move into this industry, even if you don't come from a traditionally car background. And why am I speaking about it in this way? I truly believe that if we get more people who are different, who bring different perspectives and are able to dilute some of the traditional automotive culture, then we can make a real impact and change on society, on a global level. We can serve people's true needs. We can improve the environmental impact of the industry. We can be more authentic and more real with people. We can sell in a way that makes people feel safe and comfortable. There's just so much that we can engage in. And even though this article is painting something that is, you know, quite daunting, how do we get more women into this space? What I wanna say is it's daunting, but it is an opportunity that we can take up. We can frame it really positively by saying, we need you, we really need you. And I am doing my very best to make sure that the space is a place where people can thrive. It's gonna take a long time to make these sorts of shifts, but it is coming, it is possible, and it needs to happen. If you are interested in a career in automotive and what space you might wanna show up, how do you get involved? reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'll put that below. Very soon you'll have a landing page that you can go to in order to connect with me. But for now, LinkedIn, comment down below if you have any thoughts on this. I'm really passionate about this topic. I think it's important we engage in the next level down that people get a real view of this industry if you want to enter into it. So with that, I will leave you. See you in the next one.